Thank you, Karen and Tom and Kristen and Laurel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this final Sunday of the Advent season.
acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Listen. I long for the land that is not. For all that is, I am weary of wanting. The moon speaks to me in silver runes about the land that is not, the land where all our wishes become wondrously fulfilled, the land where all our fetters fall, the land where we cool our bleeding forehead in the dew of the moon. My life was a burning illusion, but one thing I have found and one thing I have really won the road to the land that is not. In the land that is not, my beloved walks with the glittering crown. Who is my beloved? The night is dark, and the stars quiver in reply. Who is my beloved? What is his name? The heavens arch higher and higher, and a human child is drowned in the endless fogs and knows no reply. But a human child is nothing but certainty, and it stretches its arms higher than all heavens, and there comes a reply. I am the one you love, and always shall love. It's a poem by Edith Sodergrand, who lived from 1892 to 1923. She was a Swedish-speaking Finnish poet born in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, she began, uh, she published her first collection of poems when she was aged 24, and she died at age 31 from tuberculosis. And yet, some powerful words. My guess is you've probably never heard of her. Even, even uh, people who know poets may not have, have heard of her. Um, no accident, I, I, I googled obscure women poets, so. <laughs> It's a little odd to have a man reading the words of, of a, a woman poet, but it fits the day. We have our gospel writer, it may have been uh, Luke, uh, that we meet in, in the Book of Acts, probably not, but uh, was probably a guy who wrote the gospel that we call the Gospel of Luke. And we see some powerful um, men appearing early in, in his gospel as he writes it. We've got, you know, uh, Caesars, and we've got governors, and we've got kings, and we've got uh, all kinds of powerful people, but we don't hear from them. Uh, there is one guy that shows up early on in Luke's gospel, Zechariah, who is the uh, husband to Elizabeth, and uh, he doesn't say very much. Um, he speaks just a little bit as the angel appears to him to tell him that uh, his wife Elizabeth is going to give birth and uh, very quickly uh, the angel says um, to Zechariah, shh, Zechariah, shh, hush, hush now. Why don't you just be quiet for a little bit, like maybe say nine months and let's let somebody else talk. And the ones that we hear speak are Elizabeth and Mary in their time and in their culture, both pretty obscure. Nobody would have paid a whole lot of attention to either of them. Elizabeth had not fulfilled what her culture said she was supposed to do, 
and Mary was still very young, betrothed but not yet married, uh, and we see the two of them come together, two obscure women meeting in an obscure place in the hill country of Judea, and yet these are the two, these are the two, the first two in all of Luke's gospel upon whom the Holy Spirit comes, and through whom the Holy Spirit speaks, the two who are inspired, the two who speak with the very presence of the power of God, and that these two obscure women who, who literally carry within them the seeds of God's overturning the injustice of the world. John, who will grow up to speak truth to power, and Jesus, who will grow up to be power present with us in earth. And they sing, and they sing of what is to come, and Mary in particular singing of how God will, will overturn the injustice of the world, bring down the, the arrogant mighty and lift up the lowly, not in order to flip places so that those who have it easy are now going to be miserable and those who are miserable are now going to be uh, living high on the hog. No, to set things right the way that they ought to be. And the, the question that the prophets, of course, ask is, come on, leaders, how did you allow this to be the case? You are God's called people, the ones who are, who are blessed in order to be a blessing to the world. How is it that you permitted a world in which a very tiny few hold so much power and comfort when so many are struggling merely to get by. Come on, say the prophets, including the prophet Mary of Nazareth. How is it that you have permitted this to happen? Why does God need to come and turn things around like this? How is it that you have permitted this to happen? I'm afraid she might ask you and me the same question. How have we permitted this to be the case in our world today, not just to fix it. How did we allow this to be? We are called to be a blessing to the people. Through Mary and Elizabeth, we see already that Christmas is coming. It's going to take a while. Jesus won't be born for another nine months. Who knows what kind of humiliation Mary is going to go through as people question, oh yeah, sure, sure. God's the one who gave you this baby. Sure, sure. What do you think, Joseph? Do you buy that? And then it's going to be another 30 years or so before Jesus is fully grown and enters into his ministry. And it's going to be a while before he gathers his, his followers and he brings into embodiment this song that his mother Mary sings of, this canticle of the turning of setting things right, of bringing into the world what it looks like when God is present. Those who are neglected and forgotten and despised, Jesus says, come, you're welcome, you're in. Come and be in the center, not on the outside. Those of you who are hungry, come and be fed. Those who are, of you who are hurting, come and be healed. Those of you who have messed up badly, come, you are forgiven. All of us are together, and together there is more than enough for all of us. And for this, for this Christmasing among us, he'll find himself hanging on a cross, and then in a grave, and then his Christmasing will turn into resurrecting and rising into that new kind of living that can never be broken by death or anything else, that resets creation and opens up possibilities that were never there before, that we are invited into, to be part of, of yearning for that beloved, of yearning for that land that is not. And Jesus brings that land that is not to us. The kingdom of God has come near. We taste it in his life. It may not be the kind of Christmas that we create for ourselves, it's the kind of Christmas that God creates with us and for us and through us for the sake of the world. And Mary and Elizabeth help us to prepare. Help us to prepare not just for the carols and the presents and the candles and all the, all the, the light and bright things, but for the deep Christmas. The deep Christmas of longing, the deep Christmas of justice, the deep Christmas of reorienting our very lives, the way that we see, the way that we listen to one another and to God in and through one another, the ways that we speak, the ways that we act, the ways that we are in the world, they are preparing us 
to genuinely welcome God's Christmas. It'll change things. It might throw us off our balance a little bit. We might need to pay attention to how we walk in the world. Edith Sodergran also writes another poem. When night comes, I stand on the steps and listen. Stars swarm in the yard, and I stand in the dark. Listen. A star fell with a clang. Don't go out in the grass with bare feet. My yard is full of shards. Christmas brings us a yard full of shards of the star of heaven. Shh. Listen. Christmas is coming. Amen. so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ Jesus, for whom we wait. Amen. Go in peace. Shh. Listen. Christmas is coming. Serve the Lord. By the presence and power of God, we will. <laughs>